uh, Dr. Uh, Cooper Patel. Uh, Dr. Patel is a managing partner at a five doctor practice in New Jersey. And so I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Absolutely. Let me just share my screen and we'll get started. All right. Thanks for having me on this Saturday morning for this quick shot dermatology um, discussion. So for the last and final lecture for this morning, we're going to be talking about some clinical pearls regarding onychodystrophy. Uh, really exciting topic. Um, some of my disclosures, I am a consultant for Stryker as well, Stryker as, well as PICA ProSurance. Um, we talk about our objectives for today. So before we get started, let's just go over what the goal is for today. So I want to go over some causes of onychodystrophy, um, intro the what and the why, why are we talking about this? Why is it important? Um, we'll discuss diagnostic techniques. We'll go over some of the literature on treatment. And then I'm going to present some case studies from my practice, as well as some of the practice management pearls that I've learned over the last um, 14 years. After we conclude, we'll leave some time for uh, Q&A. So let's talk about these toenails. You know, the anatomy of, a to of the nail is... Um, uh, pretty robust in, in that the nail unit includes the nail matrix, the nail plate, the nail bed, and the nail folds. This hard multi-layered sheet of cornified cells is usually about um, 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters in thickness. So in my private practice, we see anywhere from 50 to 60 new patients a month with their sole chief complaint being a discolored or a thickened toenail. So many of these patients are actually second opinion patients who've seen many providers over years without any resolution or definitive diagnosis. From a practice management standpoint, this is a very large volume of patients or people who have a complaint that we can accurately diagnose and treat with all the modalities that exist today. So why aren't we testing toenails regularly? So, you know, personally, I am a board certified uh in foot surgery as well as ankle and recon reconstruction uh, surgery. And I happily see these patients in my office with these nail issues. You know, for me, this patient walking into our doors is actually the gateway appointment. You know, one, I'm able to prove that my protocol of testing nails and coming up with solutions is actually really good medicine. You know, once a patient sees that you're taking their, their concerns seriously, um, albeit that it is just a fungal nail, you know, you are their foot and ankle specialist. The, the level of trust that, that ensues with being able to accurately diagnose um, and use the medicine to treat uh, patients, even if it is just a nail concern, uh, is huge. You know, that um, return on, on your investment of time of just taking a sample of a nail uh, is huge. I can't even explain how many patients will send their family, their friends, um, everyone uh, to you if you are the one who can handle that fungal toenail. You know, this is obviously aside from um, routine or at-risk foot care. This is really for that um, younger patient, you know, young female who tries to wear heels, can't get comfortable because the nail is thick, uh, the ones who are embarrassed to show their feet. You know, this becomes a problem of their, for their quality of life. So when we talk about onychodystrophy, Onychodystrophy is just a catch-all phrase that refers to any change in the morphology of a nail. So these changes can be caused by exogenous or endogenous factors. And we can investigate these factors um, anytime we see a nail that doesn't look uh, normal. So exo exogenous factors can be trauma, infection with fungus, bacteria, mold, yeast, or even contact dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Endogenous factors are a little bit more complicated, a little more tricky to identify because they can include inflammatory disorders, neoplastic processes, um, metabolic disorders, or exposure to uh, chemo or radiation. Now, if you take a look at the graphic that's on the screen, um, one of the most common pathologies we see uh, in our patient population is onycholysis, where the nail actually separates from the nail bed, causing pitting, bending, and, and discoloration. You know, this is often mistaken for an infectious process, but the most commonly, um, the most common pathology we see with this type of nail is actually psoriasis. With that being said, you know, a patient that has a nail with onycholysis should have additional workup by their PCP or dermatologist um, to check for any other full body manifestations of psoriasis, um, as the nail changes are usually part 
of a larger spectrum, including, you know, psoriatic plaques on elbows and knees, joint pain, um, and even changes to the, to the fingernails. So onychoschizia is a common finding um, where patients present with brittle, soft, splitting nails. And this actually, we've seen a, a lot of, um, actually I have a lot of patients complain about it uh, on their fingernails because I'm looking at their toenails. So they mentioned that it's happening to their fingernails as well. And we see that a lot with repeated um, washing and drying of the hands, um, especially during the global pandemic. Um, many of us have even uh, seen this happen to our fingernails. Um, lichen planus is one that is tough for me to uh, diagnose, mostly because it's an idiopathic, you know, T-cell mediated inflammatory condition where the nails become thin, rough, and rigid. I'm um, sorry, ridged. This can be treated by actually injecting steroid into the nail matrix. Now, I personally have not done this um, to patients, but in my research, uh, it's something that I would actually consider trying if all else uh, has failed. So nail bed tumors and melanoma, uh, they warrant proper, uh, prompt and proper diagnosis, of course. Melanoma typically presents with a greater than three millimeter brown, black, band on, on the nail um, with variegated borders. And you can often see Hutchinson sign where the proximal or the lateral nail fold uh, is pigmented as well. Um, diagnostic testing is always indicated if melanoma, melanoma is um, suspected. So some of the other things, uh, obviously paronychia, fungus, uh, bacterial infections, mold, um, and just simple onychogryphosis where you have the significantly thick nail that resembles a ram's horn. Um, I'm sure we all see this in private practice. Um, and oftentimes you can have a concomitant uh, fungal infection with that type of nail as well. Um, those nails tend to be the most problematic uh, with fitting shoes and uh, being uh, pain-free. So thankfully, you know, the majority of the patients that we see in practice are finding, are presenting with um, things that are much less ominous than melanoma. But how do we differentiate between all of these pathologies? You know, one of the questions I get is, you know, well, why are you testing? This is a clinical diagnosis. I can see with my naked eye. Well, 50% of all dystrophic nails are not due to a fungus. So we can't be fully accurate in our diagnosis with just a visual uh, exam. I mean, it's definitely good medicine to test prior to treatment, either empirically with a topical or with a oral antifungal. You know, patients are really going to appreciate your thoroughness as Many of these people have suffered with nail pathology for years, have been coming, going back and forth to a podiatrist to mechanically debride the nail without really being offered any um, treatment for said condition. Um, unlike this picture, you could be wrong. It may not just be uh, a fungus. So what kind of diagnostic tests are available? If you scan the QR code, you're, you'll see a table um, listing all the possible diagnostic tests that are available, but also uh, the specificity and sensitivity of each of these tests. But we'll, we'll go over that in detail. So the KOH testing, um, this potassium hydroxide testing is quick and simple, but it often cannot specify the exact type of pathogen. You know, a lot of providers um, do these tests in their office. I personally don't only uh, because of time constraints. It's very tough for us to uh, wait 15 to 60 minutes to look at a slide um, on a microscope. Um, fungal culture uh, is another option whereby um, you can identify the specific pathogen, but it can take several weeks to even months to obtain these results. Um, you can also get some false negatives depending on the preparation of the medium that the fungus, the specimen is grown on. Um, I find that this uh, fungal culture sort of in this um, era is a little bit antiquated simply because patients are not willing to wait weeks, number one. Um, sometimes these patients get, uh, fall through the radar, you know, and we don't contact them after the fungal culture is actually back in our hands. Um, it just, I feel like if there's something that's a little bit quicker um, that can get me um, an accurate diagnosis with high sensitivity and specificity, that's kind of the way I would go. Um, histopathology is a micros microscopic uh, examination of the nail. Um, you must have an adequate sample in order to uh, accurately diagnose the pathology. So it's recommended that you have at least four uh, millimeters of the free edge of the nail plate 
um, sent for sampling. Uh, this can be done uh, in an office setting. I think it would be quite um, tedious, uh, given that you would have to have your microscope and slides um, somewhere in your office to examine this. Um, nail dermos dermoscopy is actually interesting. I mean, a lot of dermatologists in our area do this practice um, where they can visualize microscopic features of the nail. Um, it's definitely a very simple um, test just to be almost like a cursory exam of the nail. Um, you know, if this test does show, if, if you're looking at the nail and you do see that there are some signs of infection or anything that does need to be tested, you know, this really helps guide if further testing is warranted. Again, in my practice, we don't typically use dermoscopy, mostly because of cost and time um, associated with accurately visualizing the nail. Um, PCR testing is probably the, the most uh, specific and sensitive test that is out there. Um, the test amplifies the fungal DNA, and they use um, very uh, specific um, fluorescent primers in order to uh, figure out which type of fungus is affecting the sample. Um, this, this type of test is relatively simple to conduct. Um, you can detect multiple organisms and there's a low risk of contamination. Has, Like I said before, has the highest sensitivity and specificity um, and it improves uh, species detection um, of dermatophytes 20% over fungal culture alone. I think PCR is probably the most common way to test the nail. Um, there's various labs that perform the testing, um, including our sponsors for this lecture. Um, interestingly, uh, in recent uh, developments, uh, a lot of doctors have been approached by companies to perform PCR testing in their offices. Um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to doing that. We actually don't do that as uh, either. Um, in my office, because as I mentioned earlier, the majority of our patients are uh, either pre-surgical or post-surgical. Uh, we don't have the bandwidth to set up a, you know, CLIA, CMS approved laboratory in our office. Um, I, I like to sort of keep our, our business into silos, meaning I don't want to dip my foot in every single uh, uh, body of water there is Uh a lot of practices are, you know, attempting to do that. Um, I think I want to just put my foot in the water in the Bahamas where I'm at right now. Um, so PCR testing is definitely my go-to. Um, AI. So AI is actually interesting. Um, when I was doing uh, some background on this presentation, uh, I found an article where AI is actually uh, developing. It's a developing modality but it's super exciting to consider. And there's tons of AI um, work going into medicine, especially post pandemic. It sort of accelerated our ability to do things via telehealth, um, sending pictures and, and just getting an idea, especially in the derm space. So um, in 2018, uh, a researcher named Han et al, he developed, he developed an algorithm um, that can accurately identify onychomycosis. So AI in this space, it, re it really relies on creating a large database of photographs with a vi wide variety of disease presentations. So clinics all around the world can contribute to this database, and then an AI algorithm can quickly assess any new nail pathology with a high level of sensitivity. They actually, um, the study actually showed AI versus dermatologists, and the AI fared better than the actual dermatologist um, themselves when assessing onychomycosis. So definitely very interesting developments, especially with apps being created where patients can take their own photos and have AI assess whether they need to be seen by a professional. Um, the only question I have is, does AI have malpractice coverage? Because uh, this gets into the weeds as far as who's responsible as far as liability. Um, and you'd be um, interested to know that AI for, sorry, malpractice or liability insurance for AI does exist. And it is uh, another developing market uh, that we as physicians have to consider. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about AI in many health spaces, particularly um, uh, reading or evaluating uh, breast biopsies. Uh, so I think this is something that we're going to keep our eyes on because for onychodystrophy, this could be one of the next um, big things in, in diagnosis. So once we have um, an accurate diagnosis, what do we do with that? Um, these are just some articles that I uh, 
read and I'm referencing um, as I as I talk about uh, what our treatment options are. So, you know, the treatment of nail pathologies that are not caused by a fungal species are definitely varied. Um, as I said earlier, for lichen planus, you know, steroid injections uh, can be performed into the nail matrix. Um, there are types of urea gels. There are um, products that you can apply to the nail to create a hy uh, hydrophobic barrier um, to help with the quality of the nail. Even um, supplements such as biotin uh, have been recommended to patients for um, mm -hmm. nail pathology that's mm -hmm. not fungal. So for most onco dystrophic nails that aren't fungal pathogens, uh, debridement works, you know, debridement of the offending nail using all these um, topical preparations, um, treatment of the underlying condition. So particularly for, you know, psoriasis, um, if I suspect that there is an underlying psoriatic component, I always refer to PCP um, or rheumatology for further eval. Um, I have patients who've been started on Humira um, for their underlying condition and have noticed improvement in their nails. Um, it's important to know that it could be psoriasis and onychomycosis, and we've seen that as well. Um, addressing the biomechanic causes of whatever trauma, meaning wider shoes with a deeper toe box, um, or even correcting digital deformities, assuming that those are painful as well. Um, you know, well, we've done all this with the non-fungal um, nails, but what are we what are we doing with the fungal nails? That fifty percent of our patients who do have onychomycosis, you know, that we confirm with mycologic testing. What's our next step? So, in a study by Dr. Malay, um, debridement and application of a topical antifungal nail lacquer um, showed that patients improved statistically significantly more than those who had debridement alone. So in this study, there was a 76.74 mycological cure rate. Um, interesting to note that a mycological cure rate just means that there's a test that's negative, not necessarily that clinically the patient's nail looks better. And as you and I, uh, all 30, 240 of you in the audience know, patients are not looking for my mycological cure rate. They're looking for a clinical cure rate. They want that nail to look normal. Um, in an efficacy and safety uh, data study for a topical 10% um, ifeconazole, the mycologic cure was 60% at 12 months and 74% at 24 months. So this is, again, not the effective cure rate where um, you would see actual less than 10% uh, clinical involvement of the nail. Um, if we talk about the truth on the, the, the clinical cure rate, that was probably closer to 17.8% at 12 months and 19% at 24 months. Uh, it's interesting. I can barely get my patients to take antibiotics for three days. I struggle to have them use any topical um, agent on their nails for 12 to 24 months. I, I find that patient adherence or compliance with the treatment is probably the rate limiting step with these topical um, treatments. But some of the other things I've seen with topicals are really just site reactions um, that can be mild to moderate, but about 2% of the patients can actually develop ingrown toenails um, with swelling and you know, redness and pain. Um, these particular patients will come in and, and complain that they've never had an ingrown before. Um, and just to remember that, you know, you might have prescribed a jublia in the past or um, any other topical um, medication. Um, you guys also know that the cost is a factor. You know, when we are talking about topicals, if the majority of the patients who we're seeing are uh, Medicare patients, we know that many of the topicals are not covered. I've had instances, I'm in New Jersey, so Novitas is our carrier, but we've had issues where you know, a Medicare has sent us prior offs for um, cyclopirox. And it's, you know, the one of the questions is, well, did you try an oral antifungal? find that absolutely absurd because these are the patient, typically the patient population that can't take um, oral uh, treatments for uh, onychomycosis. Um, Medicare really hardly will cover any of the branded uh, medications, the antifungal topicals, but a lot of the privates do. And there are lots of um, cost sharing programs that you can look into for your patients to obtain um, these medications. I've had patients who've used topical antifungals who've done amazingly well. You know, um, I am a genius in their minds because this actually worked. I've had patients who've used the topical antifungals and not had a, you know, a significant improvement at all. 
Um, so it's just important to know that there's more than one way to kind of uh, treat this type of condition. And I'm sure you guys all know this. This is probably one of the most common things we're seeing. But, you know, talking about this uh, in a lecture on a Saturday morning, I really want to just give some pearls as to what we're doing in our practice. Kind of good to know what everyone else is um, seeing as well. Oral therapy for um, onychomycosis is the most effective treatment. Um, we typically order AST, ALT function as a baseline and then throughout the treatment to uh, monitor any hepatic effects. Um, in probably the last 400 uh, patients who I've prescribed terbinafine, I think three of them had elevated um, AST, ALT at the six-week mark, which at that point we discontinued the medication um, and then retested uh, six weeks later and those, those, sorry, six months later, and those AST, ALT elevations had, had gone away. Um, the thing with terbinafine as a treatment option is we must, must, must look at a history of hepatitis or alcohol use disorder. Um, these patients are super high risk for having uh, hepatic side effects. And we definitely need to consider that when we're talking about treating um, with an oral medication. As a whole, I typically do not prescribe pregnant patients or children um, terbinafine. I will leave that to the um, OB uh, or pediatrician. Um, and, you know, just obviously taking a look at other drugs that patients are on. You know, uh, when I was in training, one of the things I would hear is, well, you never want to give terbinafine with statins. Well, you know, the the interactions that happen with antifungals are actually more common when it's an azol, not uh, terbinafine. So it is something that I have been doing more often and I haven't seen any issues. Um, so the azoles, which would be the uh, itraconazole, the fluconazole. Um, itraconazole is, is definitely a drug that is useful, but it has a much more higher, uh, much higher side effect profile um, because of the cytochrome P450 metabolism. Um, any patient that's on a uh, phenothiazine, uh, it's contraindicated to do terbinafine because of QT prolong prolongation. Um, I've actually seen in practice some true allergies to terbinafine as well, um, where patients have said full body rash, itching. Um, once the medication was stopped, the patient was put on steroids and they, were, they did fine. Um, terbinafine can also cause a decrease in, alps, uh, in the absolute lymphocyte count. So besides the topical and the oral medications um, and mechanical debridement, you know, laser has actually been shown to be quite effective. Um, in a meta-analysis uh, that's listed on the screen, um, laser with laser treat with a YAG laser, uh, 1064 nanometer ND YAG laser was about 63% for mycological cure. Um, CO2 laser was closer to 74%. Um, I have not done CO2 laser for a fungal nail in my in my career, um, but 74% is pretty uh, significant, but it's also concerned, you know, with bleeding or um, pain during that particular type of treatment. So, you know, one of the interesting things that has come up in, in recent um, years is that just like antibiotic resistance is developing, there's been an increase in terbinafine resistance. So the fungi are actually mutating their um, squalene uh, epoxidase genes, and that is typically the gene that is being targeted by uh, terbinafine. So, you know, is this something that we have to be um, considerate of? Yes, absolutely. Um, definitely want to uh, consider terbinafine resistance in recalcitrant cases. Uh, PCR testing with terbinafine resistance it, assay is definitely a helpful um, way to figure out if this particular nail has, a uh, patient has this resistance or should we consider alternative um, uh, treatments. So should we empirically treat without a definitive um, diagnosis? So some say, why not, right? Um, I know a lot of providers who don't uh, test nails and they say, well, it's a clinical diagnosis. I can just treat it. If it gets better, great. If it doesn't, you know, They'll see another one, another doctor. Um, so for me personally, I would say uh, I don't think we should empirically treat without a diagnosis. You know, topical uh, treatments, as I said earlier, can be very costly and, you know, relatively in ineffective depending on the patient's um, adherence to application of the medicine. Oral antifungals are effective, but they can have side effects, you know, drug to drug interactions. And um, many patients are really uh, opposed to taking anything orally for a toenail fungus. 
laser again has been shown uh, to be, be beneficial, but it can be costly. You know, in in my opinion, you know, is this good medicine? So, you know, patients really want to know what their diagnosis is. You know, when you're seeing a patient with on a dystrophy, although it's a you know a common pathology we see to the patient, it's it's a major concern that affects their their daily life. So, if you think about your own practice. Um, just think about how many women come in and tell you that they never show their toes. They never wear open toe shoes or they can't walk in certain shoes without pain. You know, so to us, to the provider, this condition is very low on the severity level. But to the patient, it can be one of highest concern. Uh, and this is just in patients who are relatively healthy, active without any other comorbidities. You know, when we hit that, uh, the diabetic population that we see quite often, it's just 30% more common in diabetics to have um, onychomycosis. Um, I have seen ulcerations on the nail bed, really from the thickness of the nail. Um, I have seen um, fungal infections that the patient tried to treat themselves by trimming the nail, creating a wound, um, just lots of, you know, things that can go on. You know, patients really have a better satisfaction level when their physician takes their concerns seriously. So as a board certified podiatrist in surgery, you know, majority of the practice that I run is surgical, um, anywhere from foot procedures to total ankle replacement, but I still see and treat the nail disorder. I mean, it's not clinically as intensive as what, you know, a, a pre-surgical eval or a patient who goes through, um, you know, a major uh, reconstruction. But if I get a good thorough evaluation for a nail condition, the patient comes back um, and they come back for all of their foot nickel needs. You know, if there are any of the um, younger grads on this call uh, listening, I mean, this is one of the easiest ways to market yourself and really set yourself apart is really practicing good medicine, taking samples, um, knowing what you're dealing with and treating once you have a diagnosis is it goes a long way with uh, developing patient trust, but also having these same patients know that you take them seriously um, and creating this long term relationship, which is huge in um, creating a successful practice. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of cases that were in uh, my own office. So this particular patient um, presented with yellow thickening uh, discoloration, uh, disp distal aspect of the nail. I mean, you know, if this comes into your office, you'll probably say, I could barely see it. Well, for her, this was a uh, significant problem. She was not happy. She did, never wanted to um, wear particular shoes. She also came in for a revision of this uh, second hammer toe that you're seeing. Um, I didn't do the first case. Um, and she had tried topical therapy with no improvement. So what is it? A uh, sample was taken, obviously. In this particular case, it was onychomycosis and T. rubrum being the offending um, organism. With this patient, we actually did laser treatment. Um, I don't have an after picture, I apologize. Um, but she did quite well. And she also came back in to get a uh, forefoot reconstruction done um, from a previous surgery. My second case I'm going to show you is a patient who came in after being prescribed terbinafine. Um, she was really hesitant uh, and worried about taking a medication, um, especially when she didn't know if she had fungus because no testing was performed. Um, she was super worried about the side effects. You know, she went on Facebook and Google and got her medical information that said that uh, she'll be on a liver transplant list. And she came in in a full blown panic. Um, so I said to her, you know, it's okay, let's take a sample and we'll figure out what this is and, and decide which way to go next. Um, her results came back as uh, chronic microtrauma, um, very common, especially with she had a slight um, helix limitus um, and this toe was really banging the top of her shoe. Uh, even the PCR testing showed really no organism in, in this particular nail. Um, I recommended for her to try wider shoes with a deeper toe box and definitely not to take the shermenophene because I don't believe she would have had any improvement um, had she gone down that um, treatment protocol. So this particular um, patient uh, came in with nail changes and, and pitting and a little bit of ridging. Um, she was told that this was fungus and she was prescribed terbinafine. Um, I asked her, you know, some pointed questions about if there was any testing done, if, you know, they were definitive about a fungal diagnosis, and she had said no. Um, so after further discussion, we talked about her health history, 
Um, she reported that she had joint pain, dry patches to her elbows, um, and not this foot, but the other foot had a swollen, painful second toe. I mean, pathognomonic for, for what you, I think you guys would know is the diagnosis. So this particular one came back with um, chronic microtrauma as well and onycholysis. Um, I referred her to a rheumatologist who diagnosed her with psoriatic arthritis. I, for her, I actually recommended that she start uh, biotin as well. She had some um, brittleness to the fingernails as, uh, as well as the toes. And the rheumatologist actually started her on uh, Humira. Um, and she had some improvement. Uh, was the nail perfect? No. Um, but she also didn't take any uh, terbinafine uh, for no reason. This particular case four was a patient who came in with a complaint of a discolored toenail. So he played, uh, he played soccer three times a week with um, cleats on. And, uh, you know, he wanted to know if I could take the nail off and can you go back to soccer over the weekend? And I said, no, uh, because that nail is going to come back with whatever pathology it is. Or, you know, if there is some micro trauma, we're going to have to, you know, change the shoes or figure out what's causing that trauma. And, and then we would go from there. Um, so for him, absolutely micro trauma uh, with onychoschizia with pathological splitting of the nail. He had no underlying conditions. He had no other associated joint um, or skin pathology. So for him, I recommended uh, we use just wider shoe gear, mechanical debridement just to bring the, the thickness down and then uh, a topical urea gel with biotin supplements, um, PO. And he did quite well. So this patient um, was referred to me by his uh, oncologist, actually called my office, said needed to speak to me. It was urgent because his toes were gangrenous. They turned green, um, which was interesting uh, because his toe was actually green. The skin itself had a green hue to it. The nail had a green hue to it. Um, it started uh, over the last week and uh, they weren't sure what to really do at this point. Um, he was on active chemotherapy for um, prostate and lung cancer. Um, when he came in, obviously the nail was thickened, discolored, yellow, green with striations. So I did take a sample of that nail. And not only did he have scant um, micro trauma to the nail, but his PCR came back with pseudomonas. Obviously, this this is a could have been a clinical diagnosis, but um, just with the nature of how it started and his medical history, uh, I wanted to make sure I knew what I was dealing with. I so, I mean, his, I didn't send you the rest of the foot in, on this picture, but he had some pretty extreme uh, green discoloration to the toes uh, and wanted to be 100% sure and, you know, be able to send back to the oncologist, like, this test exists, we do it, send us, you know, all your patients who have nail pathology. And we see quite a few patients who have chemotherapy um, induced nail pathology and even neuropathy because we're able to accurately diagnose them. So for him, he was started on oral Cipro. Um, and had complete resolution in a week. This particular patient complained of a thickened toenail with pain on palpation and discoloration. Um, the distal aspect of the nail, which you don't see here because this is a post-debridement picture, uh, was detached from the nail bed. So the nail was then trimmed, um, and this is what the underlying surface looked like. You know, this patient had been struggling with this for over a year, um, I believe they had a pacemaker. We couldn't do an MRI or otherwise, typically I would do an MRI um, to see if this is some uh, glomus tumor or is it uh, just an osteochondroma. Um, this patient wanted uh, this nail and nail bed to be taken care of. We took this patient to the operating room, did an OR bone biopsy, and actually the patient was found to have an osteochondroma. Um, once we resected the bone, you know, eventually the nail grew back, you know, obviously we had to level set their expectation because the nail had to be taken off completely, um, because it was just too damaged. Uh, and within, I wouldn't say about a year, year and a half, the majority of the nail had returned. It was thick. It, uh, you know, I think he probably could do with another, um, biopsy if it is still thick and discolored, perhaps, um, he has a concomitant, uh, fungal infection as well. So this last case that I'm going to talk about, um, patient had previous nail testing and it showed onychomycosis due to T. rubrum, um, great toe and the fourth toe. So the patient was started on uh, terbinafine as well as topical 10% efficonazole. So 
She had been using both topical and oral treatments. Um, she noticed an increase of redness and swelling uh, to the fourth toe, extending to the dorsum of the foot. Um, I mentioned earlier, one of the common side effects of topical eficonazole is actually uh, ingrown toenails and paronychia. Um, so this particular patient had a bacterial culture done and it showed that she had MRSA. So she was treated with medicine and obviously the topical medication was uh, discontinued uh, as she was already on the uh, terbinafine and we decided it was just overkill, no reason to create any additional um, paronychia or ingrown infections. The moral of this story on Saturday morning as I'm streaming to you from the Bahamas is that accurate diagnostic testing is warranted to ensure that we are doing no harm in the clinical management of onychodystrophy. You know, as to diseases, make a habit of two things, to help or at least to do no harm. Um, so in conclusion, onychodystrophy can have a wide variety of causes. Um, onychomycosis is a medical condition that can be diagnosed with a variety of tests. PCR testing has uh, high sensitivity and specificity and can quickly help to identify an organism. Um, when we do these types of tests, we really want to think about not only good medicine, but um, how our patient satisfaction increases, how we can increase our patient retention and referral sources. Um, and that's all I got for you guys. Great job. Great Thanks, job. Thanks, Rich. Wow, excellent. Um, do you just stop screen sharing so we can be full screen again? Yep. And uh, we got a whole slew of questions that are uh, that are pouring in. So uh, we're going to just kick it off with some of those. Um, so uh, Dr. Barnes, uh, can you bill for treatment if this is not a painful issue and only cosmetic? Is this a patient who has uh, underlying issues? Are there any class findings or is this a diabetic? Um, Karen, maybe you can uh, clarify on that one. Um, I'm not sure that that was the only. Yeah. So if it's a healthy patient, they're coming in for a first visit and we're doing a, you know, a testing, I'm billing for the E&M. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Goodman, what is your approach if you see a suspicious four millimeter longitudinal lesion on the nail? Uh, I am typically doing a biopsy, but not just of the distal uh, part of the nail. I'm doing a full uh, nail unit biopsy with anesthesia, you know, consent, the whole thing. Okay. Very, very documented and sending that out. Um, Dr. Hurt, uh, can you bill anything additional, i.e. biopsy for taking nail sample for testing to verify um, onychomycosis? So that's a tough one. You know, for a while we were billing, um, getting the specimen. There's a specimen code. Um, but it ha it typically was being denied and was, you know, included in an E&M. So for me, diagnosis and, uh, sorry, um, documentation is key. So my note will mention every single pathology that this patient has that we've talked about, right? So unfortunately, you may not be able to get an additional code for taking the test, Mm -hmm. But what I will tell you is it will come back in droves when this patient is happy with the treatment that you've performed. So it's kind of a longer term thought process that the patient's going to come back. They're going to send their family. Um, but there is no uh, code specifically for taking that sample. Mm -hmm. It's like we spoke about earlier, right? Yeah. The patient and then the, 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 they bring their families. So it's more than just that one code for that one payment. Exactly. Um, what if you do multiple testing on nail um, and uh, PA um, S is positive, but PCR shows no fungus? You diagnose um, onychomycosis and still treat it, especially since PCR is supposed to be more sensitive? So it depends. If I thought that I took an, a really robust sample and PCR was negative, right? Mm -hmm. I would say... I would go with the PCR if for whatever reason, even if I felt the sample wasn't perhaps enough or if the patient was using some sort of antifungal therapy in the past, yeah, I may not find the positive PCR result. Um, if I have histopathological, histopathological um, 
you know, it's Bahamas. I can't talk because I'm on vacation. Anyway, um, if the histopathology was positive and the PS was positive, I would likely treat and let the patient know that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I am going by my clinical judgment here that I've done this test. This is two, two out of three are saying yes. One is saying no. Let's try it. Um, letting them know the full, you know, the side effects and, and possibilities. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kincaid Washington, at what elevation of ALT, AST do you discontinue uh, terbinafine? So interestingly, in the beginning of my career, I would discontinue for any elevation. Um, if it was 30 to start and it went to 45, I'd be super nervous. Oh my God, this patient's going to need a transplant. Now, um, I, you know, I know, and I've seen so many trends with the elevations that your ASC, ALT can elevate at any point on medication or not. Right. So there is this kind of fluctuation that we see. So for me, a two X, three X elevation, that's when I'm getting concerned. So we started at 30 and it goes to 60, 90. Then I'm a little bit hesitant on continuing the medication. Um, I talk to other dermatologists as well who say, you know, two, two times or three times is probably the, the golden rule um, as far as uh, elevation of the AST, ALT. Awesome. Wow. Speak, one more thing. Yep. Is that thunder? Oh my God. Don't bring yeah. it here. Um, another thing I would say is about testing. If you have patients, you know, I'm very close to New York City in my practice. Um, so if you have patients who uh, emigrated from another country where hepatitis is very common or, uh, or they may have had a history of, you can send for a hep panel as well. Just to kind of cover yourself, um, make sure that we're not, you know, creating a problem uh, by starting them on the antifungal. Um, Dr. Schaefer, uh, I always prefer to biopsy nails before initiating treatment, though in my area, there are few insurance companies who determine claims with nail or onychomycosis, ICD codes, are cosmetic routine book care, or just say this is a non-covered service. My patients end up with a large patient responsibility. Do you have patients sign ABNs uh, for this and let them know they might be responsible for the cost of the biopsy? So for the biopsy, I'm not having them sign ABNs because I'm not billing the biopsy, right? So the mm -hmm. ABN wouldn't apply for me personally. Um, what I will say is I never use the onychomycosis code when I'm doing a biopsy because I don't know that it's onychomycosis, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm typically using a disorder of nail. Um, uh, there's a particular ICD-10 for I can look it up, but there's a disorder of nail, other nail disorders, um, other conditions of skin and nail. There's other codes that we can use that shouldn't give you the same um, denial only because you're not already saying that it's a fungus. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, sort of the... Use, use a much more vague code and it should be covered. Well, because you won't know until the biopsy comes back. <laughs> exactly. Just like you're not putting bone tumor when it's a mass, you know, or, or an excess dosis. Like you can definitely put a more uh, general code. Yeah, it was kind of like uh, Dr. Lerman uh, said earlier in his presentation, you know, you can't do it just by looking at it. You have right. to test it and then see. Um. So if a, if, uh, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Stipati, um, if a patient has been previously using OTC um, topicals or oral, oral antifungals, how long should they discontinue before they, before taking a nail sampling for PCR testing? So for OTC, I, I don't even think they work. So for me, it doesn't matter. For mm -hmm. topical, um, the bioavailability of our the topicals is not um, it's it's not probably not more than a week. I don't I don't think I've seen anything in the literature for bioavailability of oral antifungals closer to eight to twelve weeks, which is why we always tell patients that it'll continue to improve because of the way it's um, you know if they're on terbinafine, uh, the body can retain some of that for eight to twelve weeks. Um, so I would say three months if you're going to sample someone who's had terbinafine or itraconazole in the past. Uh, Dr. King. Um, uh, hi, Dr. Patel. Uh, I have a patient who has a longstanding uh, tapetis and onychomycosis. Uh, she knows uh, she's not the most compliant. <laughs> That's always good when they actually are aware of their non-compliance. Uh, we have tried um, uh, lacune methods, um, wild uh, pedic and topicals. Main question 
Is patient reluctant to take terbinafine orally as she may be trying for a baby? Is there anything else you would suggest? So um, interesting is, you know, pulse dosing is an option as well, right? So seven days of terbinafine with a loading dose of 500 and then 250 for the remainder of the six days. That's been shown to be effective as well. Um, she can do a pulse dose and there has been no study to show that it in interferes with um, a female who's TTC and trying to conceive. Um, obviously, if and when she found out she were pregnant, she could discontinue. Um, but the same way that she knows when, uh, you know, ovulation is, you can time it to take that medication as soon as you know that you're not pregnant that month, right? If you're only going to do one week, then there's, there's ways to get around it. And we've done that with some patients who um, maybe I think Dr. King might know uh, what I'm talking about, but there's definitely lots of ways to track ovulation and when is the right time to treat, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then anything else I would suggest is, you know, at, at some point, just wait um, until, it, you know, a lot of trying to conceive moms can be very nervous about things impacting their ability to get pregnant. So for for me, I would even say to the, the mom, the mom to be just wait until the baby's here, you know, and you're not breastfeeding. Um, and then we can always treat it. And that's just my honest answer to them as a you know, female who's had kids. I get it. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> um, okay, we have a, uh, I think I pronounced this Nolaka, uh, Dr. Nolaka. Uh, if you do a total nail avulsion and send the nail off for biopsy, what, which can back, which came back for pseudo, pseudomonas, no clinical evidence of infection or no drainage, would you still um, uh, prescription oral medication or would topical medication be sufficient? I'd probably do topical. <laughs> yeah. And, and most of the time, the pseudomonas can just be a contaminant on the patient's nail. But even if you did five to seven days of a topical, you know, you've done your, your job mm -hmm. just to get rid of that. Um, okay. So, uh, Dr. Lee, are, are, are taking both a PS, GMS, and FM, and PCR test for nail pathology? Um, Am I sending them for all of it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, another Dr. Lee, what are your thoughts on tea tree oil? for onico dystrophy, uh, do you find that it is effective or would it be better or just recommend uh, urea gel and biotin? So interestingly enough, I know many of the docs on this call have patients who have home remedies. So I get the apple cider vinegar soaking, I get the Vicks, I get the tea tree oil. Um, tea tree oil has to me shown that it can thick, uh, decrease the thickness of the nail. So even if clinically the nail looks better, I think the patient's happy. Some of that applying and doing is really, a lot of these meds may just be a placebo effect, right? The patient's actually doing something about the condition and they feel that it's better. Um, clinically, I've seen that tea tree oil as well as urea gel can help with the thickness. And biotin, um, I recommend pretty much for anybody's hair, skin, and nails. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Valdez, um, I have many two to six-year-old children uh, psoriatic, uh, concomitant fungal nail infections, positive on PCR. What do you recommend for topical treatment regimen? Just Emerson, hey, I haven't seen you in a hundred years. How are uh, you? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So for the positive PCR in kids with psoriasis, you know, that's a tough one. I think I would probably call pediatrician, you know, call the pediatrician, talk to them um, if they feel like an oral antifungal is recommended. The problem with topical antifungals in kids is that they're considered um, off-label, meaning they're not approved yet in kids. So it's a tough sell, right? You're going to have to tell parents that this may not be covered. You may have to pay for this. Um, but it is definitely, a, uh, you know, efeconazole is one that I've tried in kids. Um, never had a two-year-old, but I think I had an eight-year-old as the youngest kid that I've tried that on. Um, I'm not recommending it. It is an off-label. It's not for this lecture, but as a, a response to your question, for sure. It's funny. When I was a kid, I had crazy nail fungus as a young kid. And then you're talking 40 yeah. years ago. And I think I took griseofulvin. Yeah, Grispeg. Yeah. This was back in uh, probably the late 70s. Mid or late, yeah, late seventies. I was like ten, nine, ten years old. It was, it was, it was, it cleared everything up back then. Yes, I don't, 
think they use it now, bro. <laughs> Your eyes are a little jaundiced right now. I'm not sure why, Rich. <laughs> I think I've recovered from that since then. I hope then. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, at what interval, uh, Dr. Maglia, at what interval is blood work appropriate? Um, hepatic panel versus complete medical panel. So our protocol in our office is uh, before starting them on an oral antifungal and then at six weeks. That's my repeat. Six weeks is normal. We're done. Okay. And they continue the medication. 